Uh oh. Uh oh. <laughs> Hang on. I'm just trying to look normal. Shoot. What is going on? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> You got this. Okay. Yes. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Thank you for taking the time to join us this evening. Uh, sorry for the delay here in the beginning, technical difficulties, but thank you for joining us for Portland Artists for Teresa Rayford. As you know, Teresa here is running for Portland mayor. She um, was born here in Portland, moved away and was visiting Portland when her nephew was tragically killed as a victim of gun violence. And that really became the stepping stone for her to become involved more um, in her community and become an active voice for her community and try to hold our elected leaders accountable and government institutions accountable um, and really led her down this path of trying to um, bring a voice to a lot of these problems, their root causes, and to identify resources for people so that we're able to solve some of these issues. So we're so grateful for having Teresa here and we're so honored to have her running as our mayor. And um, hopefully we will be able to see this change from the top down. So thank you, Teresa. Thank you, thank you for having me. Yeah, and we also have Isabo here joining us. She has been living here, hi. She's been living hi. here hi. for 10 years. She just had her debut release party for her first album. Better Metric uh, on Saturday, it was online. Uh, so please go check that out. She has a website, um, bobobarina.com. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. I'll, I'll write that in the chat for everyone. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks for having me. Yeah. And we have Amanda from, uh, from our Fingers Crossed Interpreting and she will be uh, switching back and forth with Andrew from Fingers Crossed Interpreting for our deaf and a hard of hearing friends. So, oh, um, if uh, if you guys uh, do, you, if you have anything to say, or um, oh, actually, I have more to say. <laughs> <laughs> just to just to remind our viewers that uh, there's an online chat here for you to log in and to 
ask questions for Teresa. This is your time to get to know her, her platform, her history, anything you want to know, please uh, ask in the chat and I'll make sure that she answers those. And also uh, you have to get your ballots in. So make sure that you put them in the mail by May 14th or drop them off in the proper locations by May 19th. And tell your friends, tell your family, tell your neighbors, tell everyone to uh, vote and vote for Teresa, of course. And we've got more shows coming up, a couple left for this week and they're down below in the description. So check those out. Yes. And I just wanted to thank everybody that's currently doing phone banking for us. There's so many people volunteering and I know right now we have volunteers that are doing online training for people, um, utilizing Zoom and other ways um, to connect with communities. So thank you so much for all of that. And then also I wanted to tell people that are supporters that we have uh, more window signs and stickers. <laughs> um, and these ones right here say, I voted for Teresa and they were made by Amea Akimoto, who is one of the youth who I work with in my organizing. So um, if you've already picked up your ballot, I mean, if you've already dropped off your ballot and made your choice, um, please check out our website and find out where you can get your political swag and take some pictures with social media to help us spread the word. And thanks again, our website is Teresa Rayford for Mayor. Dot com. Thank you so much, Anna, for bringing this series together for us. And thank you so much, Isabel, for being here and for, you know, agreeing to perform and use your art to help us change the world. Thank you so much for that. No, my pleasure. Absolutely. Okay, so without further ado, uh, we'd love to have you take over. Awesome. Thank you, Anna. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm Isabel, and I'm going to play a handful of my songs, and I'm here to play songs, but mainly because I want to draw attention to Teresa and her campaign, um, because I just believe her, and not just like believe in her and her platform, but believe her at her word, that her experience and her follow through that she's shown in her family and her community and extended communities. I just, I trust that she is going to stand for everything that she's written out and communicated in her platform. And her platform is about people and elevating the real voices and the real needs and concerns. And I think it's about time. So I'm grateful that she's committing to this work and I am, I am honored to be here tonight, so. Life's light is going out, but your love is alive. There are ghosts that open up your kitchen, your cabinets, and the drinking from your coffee cup. But I won't let the new ones fill in the gaps. It's no trouble. Travelers, the dark to sick confuse 
So this one, a brief explanation. Um, this next one, meaning, so this song I wrote on behalf of my dad. Um, I kind of make my way through all my family members eventually at some point in time. And there's a song either for them or a way to connect with them or express things that maybe we haven't been able to um, or haven't had space to articulate in person or when we were growing up. So this one I wrote for my dad after he uh, shared a story about uh, one of his aunties that had really looked out for him when he was little when a lot of stuff kind of went wrong and went crazy. She stepped in and um, at the right moment and made sure to remind him of his value. So uh, the song is called The Prince.
gather round the table, sway here about the one who showed up to save his reputation. Gather round the table, sway here about the one who showed up to save his reputation. Futures locked down with sugar cane buns. Local boys on borrowed funds. Skills growing, they guard themselves from everyone. Gather round the table, come hear about the rolling steel, liquored up like a sadman, plowing through like a madman. Gather round the table, come hear about the rolling steel, liquored up like a sadman, plowing through like a madman, lawyer's sons. Judges, futures locked down with the sugar cane funds. Local boys and borrowed funds. Scales growing, they guard themselves from everyone. Gather round the table, come hear about those weekends, birthdays lost and forgotten. Gather round the table, come hear about those weekends, birthdays lost and At the mercy of the lawyer's sons, judge's sons. The future's locked down with sugar cane funds. Local boys on borrowed funds. Skills growing, they guard themselves.
just wanted to clarify too that the chorus that is in Hawaiian, those are not my original words. It's from a old hymn that my grandma Javier would sing with us called Yisunuke Kahuhipa. And yeah. So I have one more before we get everyone together again. And um, this one is off of the, the ipi that Anna mentioned. And it's called Ordinary Days. And it's not really a new or novel thought, but it's always, it's on my mind a lot about some of the most um, maybe tragic or the heaviest things that have ever um, happened to me or to my family or my community or just around me. Just, it's always part of the pain of it is always that it seems like it was just any other moment, any other day, everything was very familiar and common and then all of a sudden it's not um that feeling of being caught off guard and maybe you didn't have the time or the energy to appreciate what it was before it it always kind of haunts me um, but i believe that that's just the case with uh with pain and grief it's always going to come on a normal day so yeah this one's called ordinary days Thanks for listening and thank you for being here tonight to, to rally uh, all of us together for Teresa.
Thank you. That was wonderful. So beautiful. Is it clear? Yeah. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Ooh. Um, okay, so as a reminder to our viewers, please uh, ask your questions for Teresa in the online chat. Uh, this is your opportunity to get to know more about her. Um, Isabeau, is there anything you would like to ask Teresa? Or because um, you know one of the most important things for her is she wants to, she has something on her uh, website that says what uh, what matters to you. She really yeah, wants I saw that. people. Yeah. So. And so um, our platform was basically developed through the outreach that our campaign did over the last eighteen months, which included like a lot of community meetups in like coffee houses, libraries, canvassing, house parties. And so one of the things that we wanted to get out of everybody because we started a little early was um, to build a platform that was focused on the issues that people had, but also would focus towards solution, right? Mm -hmm. And so when we were looking at everything that everyone was submitting and even now the things that are being submitted um, the bottom line, the baseline thing is that um, people literally want access to engagement. They want more information on what it means to be a civic, you know, civic engaged or to be participating, uh, participating in politics um, without it consuming their lives because some people are intimidated by it. But um, I want to build that process to be more um, inclusive, more accessible, more mobile and to bridge our community's efforts in resistance movement work um, really into what we can define as fair and equal policy and human focus rather than authority or bureaucratic focus that yeah. literally takes away our humanity when it gets to the bottom line. So um, mm -hmm. it's just important to me, especially you as a musician and as someone that's young, um, it, whatever is going on in your world is most important because this is what we gave, you know, this is the inheritance <laughs> and it's kind of not all right, you know? Yeah. Well, one of the things when I was uh, reading through all, all of them felt really necessary and practical, but one that I imagine like my younger self would have, uh, it would have made sense right away to me as a, like as a kid and now it makes sense, but in a different way is um, the parks for the people and just yeah. making sure that the investment for spaces that everyone can gather in. And that um, I'm just thinking of the, my family moved a lot growing up. So there, there was never like just one park, but in the areas, most of those areas, there was like a single space that was like deemed a park and often would fall into disrepair, which inevitably just, it would, end up becoming like a hub for drugs and alcohol and then spaces where like us kids couldn't take our basketball over without my parents being like well we don't feel comfortable but we're also like packed in a house or like an apartment space and so just investing in spaces where everyone can gather everyone can have access to it was just it, it felt like one of the very few equalizers when I was little where I, I, I could take a go with my my older sister my brother and younger sister and we could shoot around with the same kids that maybe we saw at school um because we didn't have that like we didn't have like a backyard or yeah. like a space to play in so I wanted to hear more about that because I, I feel like my kid self and yes. now my adult self is like well, why not like why is this this should this should always be so yeah more on that is what I would want to do Thank you. And thank you for bringing that up because um, your story matches mine. Like you, you grow up in a community that if you're living in like a city or urban area, there's not a lot of grass. There's not a lot of trees in the spaces that accommodate people that have been, you know, pushed onto the margins. Right. And so I was thinking about that even more because of the COVID crisis and mm -hmm. how like a lot of people are talking about how we should model our city to be more small and minimized and efficient 
but I'm thinking like as a child, um, going to school and having time at the playground, but also yeah. having time to come home and like sit in a tree or go walk into a park or having space that's outside of, you know, sitting in front of a video game or just being in your room. Um, that's important because it gets you um, to being in healthy spaces. You get to kind of understand who you are and who we are in society. And the fact that we know that in this city, that we can quantify the ineffective leadership um, and how it's created outcomes that we say overrepresent communities that live in poverty um, where we're not investing in their communities. We're not investing in our parks. We're not investing in the maintenance of those neighborhoods. We're not investing in education. I would think that the current uh, way that we're spending our money in the city to kind of police those communities that we should in fact put more investment into the parks. And I think that because I saw what that looks like as a child growing up, like mm -hmm. in our parks, we had music at the parks and it wasn't just during the summertime series. That was a normal thing to wake up and have bands playing at the park and have small businesses in the park vendoring mm -hmm. and sharing their arts and their wares and things like that. Um, the rec centers that you see in the parks here in Portland, all of them were open, even those little yeah. buildings that are there. We had, you know, games and toys and people passing out lunches there. We had Scholastic that used to have reading, uh, the reading tree in parks where you could go there and you could sign <laughs> up and get free books. Um, and if you awesome. didn't have somebody at home and you were on your way to, you know, you know, home from school, um, it was always cool to go there because the investment in parks counselors and support staff there kind of made sure that your relativity to that access was available. Mm -hmm. um, even centering transportation to get families to be able to utilize the park services to get uh, resources, you know, like utility payments and things of that sort, um, utilizing some of those facilities to house food programming and things of that sort outside of just the basic lunch programs. Those mm -hmm. investments need to be made. I was a kid when we got the infrastructure we have now that um, you know encourages rec centers within a certain proximity of our parks, but we're underutilizing them. Yeah. And so one of the things that I'm known for is saying, um, what I've always said is that we need to defund the policing because we don't see a big return on investment. A lot of the referrals that come from those uh, relationships usually do show us the overrepresentation of children in foster care. Because when we talk about policing or wraparound services for families that live in poverty, a hungry child or a child that doesn't have anywhere to go after school, or if that park is a dilapidated park with you know drugs and alcohol there, but it's the only place where you can get exercise, um, they might deem that as a threat to society. They might think, think that your um, proximity to poverty in that community um, is blighted. And so your parents even taking you to the park becomes an issue. And so um, we need a firm investment in communities. And that's why it's yeah. important for people to have a closer relationship, you know, with the city. When my nephew got killed, um, one of the first things they did was talk about policing more. And I thought, well, he was 19 years old. What are we doing to build a foundation for the children so that they don't chase bullets or so that they don't commit suicide or so that we don't yeah. have all this violence that you're saying is happening between kids 15 to 25? Like what services are we putting into our communities? What values do we show in our communities um, as a commitment to them? Yeah. And when I went to the parks and they were empty, I didn't see that much of it, you know? Um, mm -hmm. it, it's not a, it's not an inspiring place and we're, we're losing out on that. Um, Definitely. but yeah, the plans for that was, it, it basically bordered off of the last budget hearings where the city literally took money from the parks, took jobs away from parks workers, um, took preschool and early childhood education programs out of our parks. And I wanted to ensure that voters knew that I'm going to make a firm investment back into our parks because that's yeah. part of my public safety platform. Yeah. The long way. <laughs> no, that feels like the long term, uh, like a short term band aid would be to increase policing, but that doesn't even really address what you were mentioning about the, the need within the community. Yeah. yeah. I like the long term. Yeah. I, I like the actual solution versus <laughs> covering it. Yeah. To piggyback on that, Teresa, we have a question from the chat about. Um, how specifically the city can use art to bring uh, people together 
um, and young people to become activists? Oh my God. <laughs> I mean, I think continuing to invest in programs like mine, um, the program that my organization has is called Don't Shoot Portland and it's an anti-violence um, you know, community organization um, that just centers children and art. But what we do with the centering of children and art is we deliver resources through advocacy and legal support to families that need it. And so in identifying resources for children, we know that a lot of them, when they do need that help, and if they have been pushed to the margins by society, um, that art is pretty much an equalizer when you have access to those resources. And so again, um, in my life experience here in Portland, I grew up in foster care. I know a lot of displaced children and we were always looked at as there was something wrong with us. And even if we didn't have anything to do with the circumstance while we were displaced from our family, um, society didn't have a safety net for us. And so a lot of them, you know, got into like hip hop or music or poetry or dance. A lot of people started finding ways to kind of hold on to something um, that wasn't a production for being safe in all these different spaces. And so um, I've always said that art for me has saved my life, that it is like a trauma reliever. I've talked to my friends at the Portland Art Museum um, and we made it available to people that could not afford to go to the museum with their children and children that could not afford to go um, outside of their school field trip um, by providing it as a free resource for people that even mentioned my organization. Um, and I think that that works for bringing society together and we should always center our children and art if we wanna bring people together because that is a platform that can be made accessible um, for all of us. And I think that if we look at the fight for, for justice in history, you're always connecting art to those stories and communicating that to the consciousness of people um, in order to build that paradigm of, of leveling up or, or building strength against whatever is harming us in society. But we gotta keep using it and we need to continue to invest in the arts. Um, I remember going to a couple of different hearings at city council where the Portland Art Museum was talking about building a pavilion in their area so that it would be more open to the community in that surrounding area and not more of a, you know, us against them, it would be more open to the public and also more accessible and mobile accessible uh, for people of all different abilities. And what ended up happening was the city, even though the art museum was raising the funds that they needed, um, the city was still resistant to partnering with them on helping make that development happen. And again, when I think about art, I think about different cities around the world that use art as a spectrum for building, again, the city components. So uh, green spaces, art spaces, open spaces, uh, we have to start building Portland forward. And yeah, they can call me a preservation buff, but that just means that I'm interested in investing in those things that I believe in. Mm -hmm. And how do you think that fits in with the city's um, ideas for, uh, the residential infill project. I know you've talked about before how um, you wanna put a pause on demolition, um, which I, I'm sure you know, you, you're referring to the residential infill project, but um, <laughs> is, can you speak about that, the city's plans for that and your, what you're talking about, the need for open spaces, green spaces, parks, all of these things? Well, it's a little bit more complex than what we have time for. But basically engineering an opportunity for communities to have a voice in these matters. Um, what I've learned just through the work that I was doing with trying to save my uncle's restaurant that used to be my grandmother's restaurant on Martin Luther King and Shaver is that um, the agencies that are in charge of development here in the city, um, they'll take a property that might just need restoration or rehabilitation. And they'll say, hey, if you level this, we'll go ahead and help you develop um, a business with apartments on top and you can accommodate that and it's gonna bring in a lot of revenue. But they're making these plans and these opportunities available to a lot of organizations and businesses that um, because they are living within this community and they have this resource of property or real estate or proximity to it, um, they're literally telling them that there's a firm investment in their planning 
for their own properties. And what I'm seeing and what's been happening over the last 25 years is that people are actually losing their properties and it's also pushing out our communities. So the promise made to us that we were gonna have more accessible, affordable housing near our communities that we had already invested like generations of community support, investment work, um, businesses that we had that are no longer there, that the displacement was real. Um, and I think that whatever investment they tell us in affordable housing and whatever is going to bring in our value, we still have empty lots um, that are still being negotiated against and for, and we still don't have a clear plan on who's doing what. Um, but until we audit these bureaus and these contracts and these partnerships, I don't, you know, I'm with the auditor on this. I want more money in the auditor's office so that we can actually see what we're, what we're planning because I don't believe that it's gonna be a fair outcome for everybody involved. And right now, when we talk about the feasibility of that type of residential housing uh, being available, it's not available to communities that live in poverty. A lot of people that live um, and that need affordable housing in Portland um, also probably need other people that can live in that housing with them. They probably need to accommodate families and re-entry. So, I would just like to, to get in there and get some real serious audits happening so that we can kind of look at what is actually being done and who are the people actually on at the table. And I don't wanna to get too like, I want an investigation, but I actually do, cause I don't trust anything. I can't even get any understanding of these processes through YouTube when I'm watching those videos. So um, looking at the documents doesn't give me any satisfaction that I'm aware of what's happening if that's the long term, everybody's confused, including the people on the committee. <laughs> Your mic is off. <laughs> yeah, thank you. I'm like, I'm not a policy wonk, like some of the people that are working with us. I'm more interested in accountability and transparency. And that's one of the processes that we know we have a big issue with here in Portland is our housing bureau and the access to transparent uh, process. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that's why so many of us support you so much is because um, like Isabeau was saying earlier, like we believe you, we believe that what you say is what we're gonna get and that you value integrity and authenticity. And you know that's the type of leadership that needs to be um, there for us to emulate, you know, I, so, yeah. yeah, so we really appreciate your, um, constant work towards accountability. That's, it's the most important thing. If we want to make decisions and we want to make promises to people in this city, um, we need to first inform them on what, what these promises are, how they affect them, um, how they can participate. Because like you said, when I moved back home, um, it, Portland had changed a lot. And I lived in Texas for 15 years. So when I came home, I was like, oh, wow, we have urban renewal. This is great. There's an investment in our city. Because at the time there was a little, um, there was, you know, like just paint and storefront repairs. It didn't look as massive as it does now, 10 years later. Um, but when I was trying to connect with community, when I couldn't find businesses, um, when I couldn't find families because they had been displaced, when I found all my elders living in these small condominiums with no real uh, access to their families, you know, all of that kind of, it hurt my feelings because I was like, wait a minute, who made these plans? Who, who came up with these choices? And when I talked to people like my Auntie Elnor and people that still own their homes, um, they were like, they didn't talk to us at all. We weren't invited to the planning meetings. They did this. And I'm like, well, who is they? You know, and that's when I started with going back and forth to City Hall and literally, you know, hanging out in the auditor's office or, you know, trying to contact different people and state agencies to find out like who made plans and why weren't people invited. And some of the answers you would get were ridiculous. Like we had a list of people, we contacted them, none of the numbers worked or no one wanted to come to the meetings and just different things around um, communicating to the people that lived there about what was happening and how we would pay a million dollars to a contractor and no one would be contacted. So it's just crazy. I'm like, wow, okay. So you gave them the list and the money. 
why not give them the money and tell them to make the list, go out there and find the people and, and communicate to them. But it's bureaucracy and that's why we have to hold it accountable and be transparent. Uh, we have one last question from the chat. Uh, Tressa, what role can the city play in raising awareness of Portland's history in order to create a more equitable society? Well, right now, um, I have a really good relationship with some of the people in the city's records and management office. Um, I go there, well, I was going there uh, once a month, but I've been going there really for a couple of years and they have all kinds of services, um, not only accessible to the public for going in there and doing your research, but also online. And with all the time that we have available right now, um, I think that like the thing that got me into looking in archives and checking out policy and trying to figure out how the city manages and works um, were the, the disparities that I was facing, right? I wanted to kind of understand how did they become disparities or why they were. I didn't really have the whole hold on racism being that anchor. But um, as I got into the city archives and started looking and researching different articles and just different words and different communities and things that people were telling me, um, it became very clear. And then I started doing even more research like with the state library and I would see like the definition of Portland blacks was like thugs, criminals, niggas, you know, like stuff like that. And so um, when, I, when I saw the framing of that language and how it was applied to our communities and even policy and how it was applied to our communities, it gave me a vision as a community organizer and as somebody seeking accountability, um, what I was up against uh, politically, because this is mandate, this is language that creates policy. So if we create policy that literally creates a burden of uh, criminality on someone before they're even actually, you know, cr doing anything criminal um, or where it excludes you because of who you are um, that's not something you can just consciously say, I'm going to vote this person in and they're going to make it better for me. They have to be mindful to use their political awareness and their commitment to community to make that change because it literally takes political will. Um, the seat of the mayor actually gets to utilize my experience um, and my commitment to service in the city of Portland um, to use my history, my experience um, the city's resources, including the city's records and management, the auditors um, as a city reference, um, and also our state leaders as a reference for support um, to kind of undo a lot of the things that we all know are happening. And we don't have to use COVID-19 to say that these things are being heightened. A lot of us have lived with these um, inequities our entire lives, you know? Um, and so it is time to get someone who's committed to dismantling, uh, you know, white supremacy, um, misogyny, um, that patriarchal lens that puts capital over people. Um, we have to be intentional. When we say liberation, we can't say it just to get the votes. We have to make sure that um, our leadership is represented um, in that. And I, I plan to do that. I keep my word. I can survive through COVID. <laughs> I'm like, now we're trying to fight for our lives. If we can remember to put our pants on and then, uh, <laughs> you know, keep our mask on, we're good. But uh, yeah, once this is over, I think we as a city have a lot of work to do in changing the direction of our city. And I believe that Portlanders are so committed to change. And we've all shown that in our actions, that this is the right time for it. Yes, definitely. Um, okay. So thank you everyone for tuning in and for um, Isabel for gracing us with this beautiful music. We've got one more song from her and um, we've got more shows coming up this week. So tell your friends and get your ballots in May 19th, May 14th for mailing, May 19th for drop off. Okay, thank you everybody. Thank you, Isabel. Thank you for having me. It's good to be here with you.
get older, time moves faster. I'll remember each cold December that led me into this great endeavor of getting older or getting better, my love. Mountains and unknown valleys, trails unbroken, and the rivers virgin to me still. The earth it grows, I grow with it still. Resolutions there set them broken, and lines they form near my neck and jawbone, which one will tell of a great endeavor of getting older, your getting. Unnamed canyons that span the distance I'm crawling towards thee Will you ease this into your shade? The water's colder, the heat of life fades Dust to life, life here, life eternal. Dust to life, from life here to life eternal. I'm getting older. I'm getting I'll remember each cold December that led me into this great endeavor of getting older, you're getting better, my love. is unable to start. Uh -oh.